Hello again, and thanks for joining me. This video is a complete tutorial on how to craft these fantasy leather bracers, where I'll demonstrate every step of the crafting process and share many additional tips along the way. Bracers are an accessory item that are worn on the wrist, and they're a great project for beginners. Be sure to watch until the end of the video to find out how to get the pattern, as well as additional information. I will provide chapter markers in the description if you wish to skip ahead at certain parts. I will of course try to keep the video concise, but I also want to ensure that anyone attempting this project gets adequate educational value, so there may be parts where I repeat information that may be present in previous tutorials. But I will also try to use each tutorial as a way to teach new techniques, so if you're using this tutorial to learn, be careful about which parts you skip. Once again, thanks for checking out this tutorial. If you like, comment, share, and subscribe, it'll help boost the signal, which helps me and might help others wanting to learn the craft find this video as well. I really appreciate all the support you guys have shown so far. We're already over 6,500 subs at the time of this recording, so thanks again. Alright, let's get the tutorial started. Cutting and tracing the patterns. The bracers I'll be making here will be a one size fits most. Consult the provided documents for fit and sizing tips. I printed the patterns out on normal computer printer paper. One thing I wanted to point out this time is that the dashed line on the pattern indicates the secondary style. The base design is the same for both styles, but one style is sharp and angular, and one style is more rounded. Why you would choose one over the other is completely down to personal preference. Once you have the patterns cut out, you'll carefully trace around the edges of each pattern with a fine point marker. You can use a pen, but beware of ink smudges. As I transfer the patterns to the leather, I'm also using a ballpoint pen to indicate the centers of the holes that will be punched out later. You can use this same method or mark the entire hole. Cutting the leather. Now we get into the cutting process. I normally make several rough cuts to separate the leather into more manageable pieces. For this project, I'm using a heavier weight of leather compared to the helmet tutorial. It's about 12 ounces and takes relatively more effort to cut. You can choose different weights of leather depending on what you're wanting to do. You're free to use any sort of cutting tool you prefer, but my go-to for cutting leather is usually my leather shears. When using leather shears, there are a few things to keep in mind. One, you need to be mindful of the angle of the cut. Try to maintain a consistent and perpendicular cut at all times. Second is cut uniformity. As you are cutting, try to keep the cut seated into the blades of the shears, so when you reset the cutting stroke, you avoid choppy and jagged cuts. When you finish your cut, and you look at the edges, can you tell a cut was made with multiple chopping motions, or does it look like one smooth cut from start to finish? And third, if you're new to leatherworking, don't expect it to be too easy. Be ready for sore fingers and muscles until you build your hand strength. In the previous tutorial, someone asked if they should cut on the inside or the outside of the line. I generally cut along the inside of the line so as to stay true to the pattern. When you trace the pattern, you are in effect tracing on the outside of the pattern, so cutting on the inside compensates for this and trues up the design line. However, there are many instances where I will favor a clean cut over staying 100% true to the line, such as if my cutting line starts to drift. I may try to correct the line, but not abruptly, because this type of correction is very easy for the eye to pick up as a flaw. Transferring Designs To make the tracing process a little easier, I will spray the surface of leather with a fine mist of water. Adding moisture relaxes the fibers enough to take an impression, but don't get it too wet or your pattern will just get soaked. Give the water just a minute or so to absorb into the leather a bit. When I'm happy with the consistency, I'll overlay the pattern to the piece and trace the design lines accordingly. I like to transfer the designs at this stage. It's up to you if you want to go with the designs as I have presented them here or come up with something different for your own project. We will simply trace over the lines with a ballpoint pen. However, it is worth noting that within the realm of leatherworking, there are actually many other ways to transfer patterns, and I'm sure I'll cover some of that in more advanced tutorials in the future. To enhance the consistency of my lines, I am only tracing the barbed designs, and I'll be using a wing divider to indicate a clean and consistent borderline. You are certainly free to simply trace the pattern as well. And you're also free to omit the designs entirely or change it according to your preferences. Casing and carving. Before you can do the carving, you need to case the leather. The method I am demonstrating here is simply to spray the pieces down with a fine mist and let them sit for a few minutes to let the moisture absorb deeper into the leather fibers. There are more complex techniques we could use to case the leather, but this method is quick and simple and serves our purposes just fine. And now we come to one of my favorite parts, which is carving. 
I'm using my favorite knife, which has a straight ceramic blade. It's not necessarily the sharpest one I own, but I think I prefer this due to the smooth and thick cuts it makes. And of course, ceramic blades are great with keeping their edge as well. You do have to strop ceramic blades regularly to keep them gliding through the leather though. I usually go for a heavy to medium pressure when making my cuts. It's actually worth noting that given the thickness of this leather, I actually could have gone much deeper with the cuts for a more pronounced edge border. Using a swivel knife for your decorative cuts is just something else that takes a little practice. It's one of those things that can seem intimidating at first, and also cramps your hands at first as well. But in time, it becomes second nature. If you follow along with each of these tutorial projects, there's a great chance that by the time you reach your third project, you'll have a very solid grasp of it all. Here's a bonus tip. This piece has some long straight borders, and since I want to carve the edges with a swivel knife, I'm locking the direction of the blade in my grip, and using my ring finger on my right hand as a firm guide, and pulling straight down. As long as your leather parts are cut out straight to begin with, you can get fast consistent straight lines on your borders as well. This isn't the only way, but it's how I would normally do it, and I can introduce more techniques as we go into the future tutorials and guides. Edge beveling. The next step is beveling the edges. While this step is also optional, I do recommend you bevel your pieces. The tool I'm using here is called an edge beveler, and it's a number two craft tool pro classic from Tandy. I'll use it along the top and bottom perimeters of each piece. This will give the edge profile a more rounded radius, which will be easier to slick later, and serves to give a more finished and professional appearance. Also, if you have any markings along the edges left behind from tracing, this will clean that up. Other than using a sharp beveler, one trick to making this process clean and easy is beveling while the leather is slightly damp. Since I previously cased the leather for carving the decorative border cuts, the moisture content is just right. If it was too wet, sometimes the leather would be too soggy to let the blade get a proper bite, and you would just end up with wrinkled gouges. You can also do this while the leather is completely dry, but since I am doing this while it is damp, the beveler can help get the burnishing process started by compressing the fibers while making the cuts. Another thing to keep in mind is the consistency of the leather will have an impact on the ease and quality of beveling. Some parts of the hide are more spongy and wrinkly and do not bevel as easily, and lower quality hides with scraggly flesh sides can also be rather tedious to trim. In the next section, I'm going to share with you some really great tips on getting very clean, smooth, burnished edges very quickly and easily without motorized tools. But first, allow me to take a moment to thank Tandy Leather for supporting these first video tutorials. Without their support, it would have taken much longer for me to produce these for you. Our interests are aligned in getting new people into the leather craft, and making armor is just one of many flavors in this awesome craft. And Tandy has always been the place I would point people to for getting started, and it's where I got started myself. As I mentioned in the Getting Started video, if you go into the leather craft store, they have every reason to help you succeed. They will give you suggestions on the tools and leather you will need. And if you can't make it to a store, I'll list most of the tools used in this tutorial in the description, and you can use my affiliate link below to get the things you need for this project delivered straight to your door. Burnishing Tips for Slick Edges There are many ways to achieve slick edges. I'm going to demonstrate how I do it for many of my projects. This will get you most of the way to perfect edges for about a quarter of the effort. You can indeed get very nice edges using just water and hand tools. The tool I'm using here is a typical wood slicker. Mine happens to be made from a more dense cocobolo wood, but its function is the same as any you can get off the shelf. There are many varieties of these burnishers, but the common factor is they all have various size notches that roughly fit varying thicknesses of leather. So you can use the pressure and friction to burnish a rounded profile into the edges of your leather pieces. I'm using a mist bottle to slightly saturate the edges. Then I'll set the edge of the leather into the best fitting groove of the slicking tool, and I'll rub back and forth with the firm pressure. What's happening when you burnish in this way is you're compacting the fibers along the edge. It's worth noting that typically burnishing means something a little different, and it has to do with the keyword being burn, so you're using heat from friction to solidify the edge fibers. But we can go into more specifics on that and more advanced edge finishing options another time. A little finesse makes the difference between this process being easy and simply not working. 
Getting the right consistency of moisture is important. If it's too dry, the fibers will not compress easily. And if it's too wet, the leather fibers will be too relaxed to hold the shape. This concept is something that becomes a little more obvious and intuitive with hands-on practice. As you can see here, the edges are now very smooth. As to why you would want to do this process, I'll give you two good reasons. For me, it just makes a nicer looking end product. And two, it makes wearable or handled items more comfortable to wear and use. Now here's one small catch to this process. Although you can use water to achieve the result, to make it last you'll need to seal it. For most armor projects, you'll be doing this anyway, so it's a non-issue. The sealant will help the fibers stay put in their compressed state even through wear. I will often do one final slicking pass as the sealant is applied and starting to dry just for good measure. Punching holes. For the next stage, I'll be making the holes that'll be needed for assembly. I'm using an interchangeable head hole punch to make the holes where the rivets will go. Mine is a shinier version compared to the cheaper one you can get, but it's essentially the same thing. I'm also using a smaller poly board as backing to preserve the tip of my hole punch. There's not much to it, but I will add that I'm using a heavier maul to make the process quicker. Just as a quick tip, you might notice how on some pieces, the hole punch head will get stuck into the leather. This can be avoided to a large extent by polishing and stropping the head of the tube occasionally. If you do that, the punch will normally pop right back out without grabbing the leather at all. Border tooling. The next step is to case the leather again. This time I'm giving it a heavier saturation using a container with water and a high density sponge that I cut in half. I'll then let it sit for a bit. How long depends on how saturated you get it how absorptive the leather is, and how fast it dries. You normally wait until the lighter surface color starts returning, which means the outside of the leather is more firm while the inside is still damp and ready to hold a tooling impression. Now I'm ready to begin the tooling. For this project, I'm keeping the design scheme somewhat consistent with the previous helmet project, and I'm using a Craft Tool B206 beveler again for the border tooling. I'm tooling to a light to medium depth in this case, you do not have to go with a bevel design like this. I chose it specifically to have a more neutral and clean look, but you could easily experiment with some scrap and come up with something more exciting to use in your own project if you wish. When you're tooling a line like this or tooling an area like a background or anything else requiring numerous repetitive strikes, there are a couple of techniques you can try. The technique I often use is to hold the tool into the cut line and apply a mostly downward pressure and drag the tool to the next position over the leather. So I will normally keep the tool seated into the line. Another technique you can use is to hold the tool right at the surface of the leather and then let the tool rebound back after striking. Depending on how long it takes you to tool your pieces or if you have to step away for a bit, it can help to spray the surface slightly at times. I'll have to make a dedicated tooling video to explain much further than this, but here's what's going on in slow motion. I'm keeping the tool seated into the line most of the time here, and dragging the tool to the next striking position. You can see how each strike slightly overlaps the previous, and I try to keep the force of each strike consistent. Bonus tip, how to fix a misstrike. If you were wondering from the helmet tutorial how I fixed a misstrike in the tooling process, let me show you. So let's say you're tooling your bevels or most any kind of tooling and you lose your rhythm and strike your tool off the line. With a little work, you can hide the crime and nobody will ever know. Part of the trick is to wet mold and overly stretch the mistake from the backside. I'm just using a marker here to do this. Doing so reduces the detail of all the tooling in the stretched area, including the mistake. Just stretch it until the mark is mostly gone. Then start burnishing it back down from the top side and smooth out the area.
Once your mark is mostly removed, you can retool the correct path and you're good to go. Leather can be very forgiving if you ask nicely. Shaping the leather. Keeping with the theme of the fantasy helmet tutorial, I'll be giving the center plates a subtle crease here as well. The process, again, is to first saturate the center of the leather and make it a bit more pliable. Then fold the piece in half and carefully strike along both sides to pronounce the center ridge. Use a hammer that has a smooth convex striking face. Now it's time to move on to the coloring process. For these bracers, I decided I would use the green EcoFlow water stain. It's always a good idea to shake up any liquid products before use, as most have solutions that will settle over time. But just remember, if you shake it more than twice, you're playing with it. Coloring the leather. I like to add the dye to a small container that I can easily dip the applicator into. I'll deviate from the fantasy helmet tutorial slightly so that I can demonstrate an alternate coloring technique and show you how to get a solid consistent color instead of the textured effect. The process here is fairly straightforward. The main thing is to apply generous coating to ensure adequate and even absorption into the leather. I'm using a piece of high density sponge to apply the stain to both sides and then taking a shop towel to wipe away the excess. Leather finish. I'll be using some EcoFlow satin sheen to seal and finish the parts of the bracers again for this project. Using a small piece of the high density sponge, I'll saturate both sides of the pieces and set them aside to begin drying. Before the pieces are completely dry, I will normally take the sponge when it's mostly dry and finesse the surface slightly. Satin sheen tends to give a low gloss finish, and I will undoubtedly cover other finishes in future tutorials as well. As mentioned earlier, just for good measure, I'll enhance the edges a bit more by burnishing while the edges are just a bit tacky and damp from the finish. Assembly. Each center plate is different, so be aware of this when assembling. 
picked one of the side panels and I'm starting from the bottom with the first center plate. I'm setting the rivets flat here, which isn't my favorite method, but it gets the job done. When the first rivet is set, I'll add the second plate and a long double cap rivet through all three layers and continue with the third plate. Since the leather was rather thick, I needed to thin it slightly to account for the rivets. It's certainly possible to skive the undersides of the holes down, but I'm just compressing the leather around the riveted areas with some hammer strikes and averaging out the impression slightly from there. This step was aided due to the leather being slightly damp still and pliable from the sheen stage. Unfortunately, at this stage, my camera's memory card filled up during the recording, so there is a portion of this assembly process that I can't add to the video. When I finished adding all three center plates to one side panel, I repeated the process for the opposite side panel starting from the bottom again. The assembly of the remaining plates is very much like the helmet assembly if you need additional demonstration. Eyelids. When the bracers are assembled, you'll need to determine how you want to adjust and hold the bracers on while wearing them. I'll probably demonstrate buckles in the next tutorial, so I decided to go with eyelets here. Eyelets are a quick and simple addition. All you need is a hole punch. In this case, the largest size of the interchangeable tubes in my hole punch set works just fine. And you need a setter as well. There are foot press attachments and at least a couple other setters, so your application process may vary. But all there is to it is to support the top of the eyelet so that it doesn't smoosh flat and to curl the bottom of the post over itself a bit to form a tight friction fit into the hole. When the eyelids are all set, you can lace it up however you like, crisscross, over under, from top to bottom, just go with whatever you want. I'll show you a couple of examples. Both will be about 45 inches. For one bracer, I'll lace it up with a leather lace. This was cut from Latigo, and the other will be laced with some paracord. You can use anything that's sturdy, really. Synthetic options like paracord or shoelaces are easier to lace up and tighten, and leather lace will make the adjustments hold in place better. While wearing them, you can tuck in the excess. So that's it. I hope you were able to learn something from this, and if you are getting some value, I hope you'll consider supporting this series. That can easily be done by engaging in some way with this video. You can let me know that you liked it in the comments, or give it a thumbs up, or share it with your friends. And if you're really happy, you can chip in a buck or two to our Patreon, and of course buying this pattern at the Prince Armory Academy website will help out a lot as well. If you need tools and supplies, please also consider using the affiliate link for Tandy or Amazon below. You can also follow Prince Armory on Facebook, which is our largest platform with a little bit of everything. Our Patreon is small, but there is a lot of behind the scenes and other content planned for it. If you make this or other projects from the tutorials, I would love to see it. Mention Prince Armory on Twitter to show off your work, and I might feature it in a future video. And check out Instagram for a cool stream of custom project photos past and present. And of course the Prince Armory website has loads of content including custom order information, albums, blogs, and more. For the next tutorial, I expect I'll do a pair of shoulder spalders in this fantasy armor theme, but I still have to finish part 2 of the Tiger Dragon helmet build, and I have a couple other videos in the pipeline as well. I'll also be working on my custom projects which take most of my time. The plan though is to pull back the curtain and start doing more project videos and shop vlogs in real time. Thanks for staying all the way to the end of this video. If you're watching this video as it just came out, there's a pretty good chance you were already subscribed. So as a thanks to you for being subbed, be sure to check out the description for how to get the pattern for free. I'll do a 3 day giveaway for this one. If you're watching this video after the giveaway is over, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell so that you can catch the next giveaway.